So we're just sitting here on the Turkish coast. It's about it's about 4 a.m. and the traffickers have been notified that we're with the migrants and they are not happy. There's a group of angry men pointing at us right now that are with the migrants. We've been informed that there's a couple traffickers hidden amongst the group to kind of advise them and talk to the boat and they want to get rid of us quick so our our security are telling us we got to get out of here but up the road the gendarme the turkish police have been patrolling back and forth we've had helicopters been going above and we're scared that if we head back that way we might be intercepted by the police instead so we're, we're dealing with human traffickers or Turkish police. And it seems like it's going to be a long night. is a continent in crisis. In fact, Europe is a continent in the midst of several crises. From questions about its conscience, its political ideas, its humanitarian responsibilities to the rest of the world, how or if at all it is going to enforce its borders and the massive demographic changes that it is facing. These are some of the most dramatic changes Europe has ever faced. But this change has been a long time coming. The Tunisian revolt of 2010 put an end to President Ben Ali's 23 years in power and led to a thorough democratization of the country. The uprising sparked the so-called Arab Spring, which worked its way across North Africa and the Middle East over the next five years. Dictators like Gaddafi in Libya or Egypt's Mubarak were violently thrown out of office and a slew of other uprisings made their way to places like Syria, erupting in bloody civil war. The chaos in places just kilometers away from Europe's borders would soon reach its shores. By 2015, over a quarter of Syria's population had found themselves displaced with refugees making their way to nearby countries like Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. Continuing instability soon made Libya a crossing point for refugees looking to make their way illegally into the European Union. So far, the mainstream conversation has been dominated by talk of refugees drowning in the Mediterranean and questions of what is our humanitarian responsibility to people fleeing war and persecution. But alongside this, there has been a second conversation, one asking questions about the women who were raped en masse in Cologne, or of cultural compatibility and religious compatibility. Just how many people can Europe handle? There are so many opinions on this issue from all different political perspectives, but we really wanted to take a look at this without the lens of politics. Just how many people are coming into Europe? Where are they coming from? Who are they? And what has been Europe's response? How many of these people are economic migrants? And what actually happens to them once they arrive on the shores? Turkey saw more than 60% of all Syrian refugee arrivals to their country more than 3.5 million people. And at the height of the crisis in 2015, the pathway between Turkey and Greece saw more crossings than any other route into Europe. 
So we'll need to draw a line back from Europe all the way to Turkey and begin our journey there. Right now, we are in Ayvalık, Turkey, and the reason we're in Turkey is because this is where the migrants coming from all over the Middle East take their first step into Europe, whether it be the islands off the coast of Greece or Bulgaria, this is where it is all happening, where the traffickers are collecting the money and sending them off on the boats, sneaking them into trucks and across the border, where all of this begins. At about 3, 4, 5 a.m., boats leave from these shores in Ivalet to Lesbos. And we're going to see if we can track down where they're leaving from, see if we can find the migrants, film the boats, and maybe even film the traffickers themselves. That's our goal here in Turkey, to catch what is going on, who are the people going across, and who is facilitating these illegal crossings. So we've just arrived. We've been doing a little bit of investigating, talking to locals, trying to find out where the traffickers are going, where they're taking off from, which routes the migrants take. And all of our investigation has led us to this spot here. It's a beach right across the water from Lesbos, Greece. And we've been told around up to hundreds of migrants come through this route every week at some points. And we thought maybe if we stay here at the times that come through around 4 or 5 a.m., we'd run across some and we could film them and even talk to them. Yeah, this must be one of the spots that they start. We've got life jackets here. Some gloves. We've got a tube. All sorts of equipment on this side of the fence. They must hide back here until late, bring the boat over, get people on, and then send them out. It's crazy. See if there's anything else. I'm a little nervous going in there. You want to come with? Uh, blankets, sweaters. Yeah, here's someone's sweater. Cigarettes, everything. Backpacks. We're gonna have to turn off these lights pretty quick here and be super quiet because we don't want to get discovered by the traffickers or the migrants and scare them off because we want to see what it's like on the ground for these people coming into Europe. So it's coming on 6 a.m. here. We stayed up all night scouting things out. And I mean, the beach is littered with evidence of these migrants, but we didn't come across any people and that's what we're looking for. So we're probably gonna wrap things up before it gets light out and we all need some sleep because tomorrow night it's gonna be another all-nighter looking for these traffickers and migrants. At 2 a.m., I'm in a small little village in Turkey called Kuru Oba, right across the water from Greece, and I'm here to speak to an olive farmer. Apparently, his land has become a direct passage for the influx of people to Europe, and I want to find out more, ask him some questions about what is going on here in this tiny little Turkish coastal town. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me here. <laughs> My great grandfather farmed here, along with four generations after him. We grew crops, 
mainly olives. We tend to animize. It's farming. It's what we do. The villagers here are busy every day. Everybody works. This is what the village life has always been like here. Before the crisis, the villagers would go to their fields alone to tend their crops. But not anymore. Women especially. They can't go out anywhere alone. Now, they have to be escorted, even on their own farms. It all started in 2013. Started slowly, with a few migrants passing here and there. But now, thousands pass every day. This village is on the coast, where they launch the boats at the dead of the night. So, it's where they wait. Then the crime started, and it got worse and worse. The traffickers started killing people they had arguments with, including the migrants. No one in the village could go to their own fields to pick olives. The traffickers had taken over the land, and it got worse. They turned up at my farm, pulled a gun on me, and told me they wanted the deed. They were acting like the mafia. These people are dangerous. If you are filming here, you need to be careful. The traffickers disguised themselves as migrants. We are all frightened here now. I'm 55 years old, and now I have to carry a gun just to tend my field and animals. There are 20 more villages just like ours along this stretch of the coast. I would say 1 million people have passed through just on this coastline. So I've just finished speaking with the local olive farmer here on the coast of Turkey. And honestly, I'm completely shocked by what he had to say. I don't think we consider often that there is a Turkish perspective to this migrant crisis, and it's not quite what people think it is. They also feel that their homeland is being affected by this and not in a good way. And they're also confused by this open border policy going on in Europe and their own country. So that's something that I've never heard of. We kind of just get told that it's this racist European opinion that people can't come in and they can't assimilate. But the Turkish people also recognize that they have a different culture to different Middle Eastern countries as well. And there's a clash going on and a crisis going on here, right at the beginning, right before these people come into Europe. So that was just fascinating. And this farmer told me that tonight there will be migrants almost certainly trying to cross the water over to Greece. So right now we're trying to be really quiet. We are hiding down a little road. It's one of the paths that the migrants and traffickers usually take to get to the water at about 4 or 5 a.m. and then take their little boats to Greece. So, yeah, I'm gonna lay low and hope that we run into some migrants so we can ask them about their journey. So it's night number three of pulling an all-nighter, searching for these migrants, and I'm actually a lot more hopeful that we're gonna run into some people tonight because we've changed locations and we're in a far more high traffic area. But after getting that information from locals, we also found out that these aren't just traffickers, like these people are armed. Like they've come up to people's doors with AK-47. So as much as I'm excited to potentially run into these people, I don't know what's going to happen if we actually find them. Are the doors locked? Oh my god. Come across. Okay, Open the door. Let's follow them down. Open the door. 
guy in charge is not with them. He just gave them a pathway, told them keep walking and I'll show up with the boat. And they're unsure if he'll be there or not. How much you one pay? One thousand dollars. Well, one thousand. They pay one thousand dollars for each person. Each person. Each person. And then they'll take you to uh, Lesbos. Yeah, Lesbos. Lesbos. Yeah. And why? Why do you want to go to Lesbos? Because in Afghanistan they will try more. We cannot go. We don't have the money. We don't have money. We don't have any money in Afghanistan. Why not stay in Turkey? Because we don't have anything Kim Lee. No ID, nothing here. Hmm. Not my family in Turkish. I don't have anyone in Turkish. Oh, is your family in Europe? Yeah, yeah. What have you heard about Sweden? It's best country. Best uh, country. I like. I want to go. So right now I'm standing on a beach with a bunch of migrants or refugees and they're all trying to cross to Moria but there have been gendarme all across the roads arresting people, stopping them from going over so we're not even sure if their boat is going to show up. They've come down here to the shores and they have no idea where the boat is. They've all paid thousands of euro to make this journey and it's uncertain whether there will even be a ship arriving at this point. And they keep, in fact, they've mistaken us for their guides. We're just waiting here. We're not sure how long we should save because there's a gender of a boat going back and forth here. And we don't want to get arrested with everyone if that happens because all our footage will be taken away. So we're going to lay low, be quiet, and see if a boat arrives. But we've got to get out of here soon. split up they were all confused as to whether the traffickers were coming or not and there were a lot of gendarme Turkish police around tonight and we think the traffickers may have even had a scout out that saw our car and thought our car may have been one of the police so the boat decided not to show up it could still be showing up right now we're uncertain but we decided to get out of there before the lights came up because we're either stuck between police and a bunch of angry migrants that didn't get a boat. So we're gonna try to get out of here, get safe in the car, drive away, and then assess the situation and see what happened. Just, we do not wanna get arrested today and we don't want migrants angry because their traffickers didn't show up. After talking to the group, some of whom were refugees, some of whom were not, I was surprised to find out that many of them had not been actively looking for passage to Greece, and that many of the mostly Afghan migrants had in fact been approached beforehand by the smugglers. Hey, I, I haven't heard from you in like, a week we were getting a little worried there are you guys okay in morocco what's going on we've managed to get ourselves uh, an interview a frontline interview with one of the guys who actually traffics people so places them in a boat puts them on a boat to spain and pretty hard to get the interview but he agreed to do a nice. video interview for us okay. there's a couple of issues here in morocco though i'm, I'm sure you're, you're aware but um, filming is really restrictive legally here it's pretty crazy there's checkpoints everywhere so bring the bare essentials that you can to get this done um, we'll break the cameras down there is some real ramifications if we do get caught. Um, there has been journalists jailed here, and I need to jump on this quickly. Next couple of days. Okay, so we just here in the mountains of Midor, a little town on the coast of Morocco, right across from Spain, where tons of migrants from sub-Saharan Africa are 
just sitting here waiting for their chance to get on a little dinghy raft to go over to Spain. And it's been hours. We've been waiting all day and our guy hasn't shown up. He's nowhere to be found. He's sending us really brief messages, yes, no, back and forth. He's super nervous about talking to us, but I'm just gonna kind of hold out here and see, because if we could talk to him and really figure out what's going on here, that would be huge. So it's getting dark soon. We're probably gonna have to interview him in the dark if he does show up. I'm 20 years old. Yeah, I, I spent eight months here. How do people get to Spain? Uh, people have to get, have to spend a lot, lot of money here. Uh, they, they have to spend 2,000 euros. Wow, uh, uh, but it's not guaranteed. When you enter in Spain, you are lucky. When you don't enter, you are lost the money. You try again to, to have another money to, to go. So you can pay more for a guarantee? Yeah, we have the guarantee you have one bank. Everybody, everybody, 2,500 euros, 2,500 You have, uh, when, when the boat enter, uh, the boss have a lot of money. How, how many people are sent over to Spain from here a, a week or a month? One day, one, one day you can have 500, 500 person. Or one day you can have 500 person, but the most you can have 2,000. Why don't people um, legally apply? Why don't people uh, try to go in legally? Uh, because of, you know, in our country, it's so difficult to have a visa. Uh, yeah, it's so difficult to have a visa. To, when, when, when you have money to give the government, when I, operation I guess they're so worried that we're working with the cops we're trying to set them up we're trying to get them arrested and he just sprinted into the woods and he's got a half mic he's gone there's a good chance he's not gonna come back he's gonna think that this is all a setup we're gonna lose and burn all of our contacts in this area so he actually came back which is awesome, and he brought the lab. So it looks like we haven't totally burned our contacts there. It's all a business. I mean, we're not talking about refugees here. Refugees can't afford to pay these 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 euros to get over to Spain. People who are dirt poor trying to escape their country, these kids who are living on the street just starving to death in Sub-Saharan Africa, and they're not the ones getting on these boats. They can't afford that. We're not talking about the poorest of the poor. The people who actually desperately need to come to Europe, they're never going to get to set foot there. They're never going to get to come over. They can't afford these prices. That's what's so freaking sad about it. It doesn't seem like any of this. And until you get, I guess, until you get to the last leg of the journey where you've got these NGO boats, none of this is for humanitarian aid. And I mean, you've got tons of Canadians, tons of Americans, tons of Europeans donating millions of dollars for these NGOs to go into the water and save these people because they think they're Syrian refugees. They think they're poor people escaping corrupt governments that are oppressing them. 
And all it is is they're just the last leg in a giant human trafficking operation, making these people in Morocco millions and millions and millions of dollars. And the people they're helping are not who they think they are. It's really sad. It's really, really freaking sad. It's easy to underestimate the scale of the operation in Morocco. But when you add up the figures, it becomes clear that these numbers add up to more than 100,000 euros per boat and millions of euros every week. One route that is particularly interesting are these two Spanish enclaves nestled on the coast of Morocco, Ceuta and Melilla. Every day, thousands of legal workers make their way back and forth across what is becoming known as Europe's most fortified borders. It is increasingly becoming one of the largest crossing points in 2018, with thousands making their way to the enclaves and then into the EU Schengen zone. <laughs> So right now I'm standing in a small little Spanish enclave on the tip of Morocco called Melilla. And right across this border is Morocco. And in recent months, this has become a new hub for illegal migration with people desperately trying to get over this fence into Spain so they can make their way through Europe. And we're about to head to the other side of this fence to go and investigate just how they do it. Just kilometers away from the fence, we trekked into the mountains to investigate some of the locations migrants were setting up camps in preparation to make the crossing. Yeah, I, hear, I was here since uh, 2017. Yeah. I decided to leave Gambia to go to foreign, you know, so that I can be having more professional, to be, to be professional in football. Amen. Yeah, that's why I live in Gambia. Do you have any guess of how many people in total are here today? Oh, in all that place, I can see 200 people. You can find 200 people in one camp. In one camp? Yeah. And there's camps scattered everywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And have you tried to go before? Sure, I have tried. I have tried a lot of times. I have tried, but still now. When we cross, they never come back. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any boat that crossed to Spain never come back. Hmm. Yeah. If they see us with this, with their passport, you know, they will, they will deport them. Oh, they destroy them, so rip out the pages. And you were saying you want to go to London, yes? So, <laughs> that's my favorite country I want. Well, in the camp, we met the leader of the group, whose job it was to take the money find food for the migrants, and was the link between those hoping to storm the border and the head of the smuggling syndicate in Morocco. This is a place people wait before they cross the fence, to get to Seato, which is European soil. It's where everyone wants to go. Once you land, you never come back. Our men here leave their wives at home and wait here to cross. One day they hope to bring their wives. I'm doing this because I know the system here better than anyone, and I want to help these people cross. So they're right. Their lives here are no good. We are all created equal people. Borders should not be in place like this. There are two ways you can come. One is by boat, and the other is on the fence. Here, we jump the fence. Once every month, we all pick a date. Then we all get together and any weapons we can and storm the fence. This takes a long time to plan and not all of us make it. In fact, most don't make it. I hear a lot of people say once they make it, they regret the trip and Europe doesn't turn out how they want it to. Our next jump is coming up soon. 
Trouble has broken out at the border of a Spanish enclave in Morocco where hundreds of African migrants attempted to storm the coastal city of Soweto in their efforts to reach Europe. The resulting clashes saw police officers attacked with acid. So we need to talk about Moria. It's one of the single issues in this crisis to, to receive almost more attention than anything. It's this small little refugee camp about a 15 minute drive inland on the Greek island of Lesbos. And this small camp has processed and received hundreds of thousands of Europe's refugee asylum applications. It's a processing facility that's designed for about two and a half thousand people, but realistically holds around 10,000 in small tents surrounding the actual facility. And the news reports that are coming out of this place are horrifying. We've heard reports about starvation, murder, theft, the rape of women and children in these tents at night, and even that this facility is being used to filter ISIS into Europe. So there's no doubt that this is a place we are going to need to visit while on our trip. The camp is completely full. Oh, inside is completely full. Completely, completely How many people? Uh, here on, on the Muria, just uh, I think uh, nearly 11,000 people. 11,000? Wow. Yeah, they were How many people uh, come per day? It, is, uh, it depends. Some days come 300 people, some days 100, some else. Yeah. No security from beginning from there. No security from there to there. Nothing. Is it quite dangerous? It's quite dangerous, not security. Sometimes they, were, uh, they become fighting between the refugees. Mm. It's uh, not security. Moria, no good. Moria, no good. Moria, no good. Greece, no good. All right, all right. We cannot compare between Moria and Yemen. You know, mm -hmm. there is war and there is uh, also here uh, problems uh, and no safe here. This place is no safe. We escape from uh, uh, our country because there is no safe. And we came here uh, no safe also. Mm. So uh, no difference. No difference. Is it dangerous here? Oh. Yeah. Why what is what's dangerous about it? Lots of fighting? Do you regret leaving Afghanistan? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You wish you stayed in Iraq? I wish you stayed in Iraq. Do you wish you stayed home? Yeah, why not? Did it cost you a lot to come here? Yeah. 1,200 1, euros. 1,200 euros to come here from Turkey? Yeah. For me, 500. Some people uh, may pay 1,000. 1,000 euros? Yeah. It's a business. I think it's a business. It's The camp is a business? Yes. But they are paying for a smuggler, huh? They are passing the, the borders. Almost your two, two thousand, three thousand dollars they're paying for uh, each person. And where do you want to go to? After here? Yeah. Maybe to Belgium or uh, Iceland. Belgium or Iceland? This makes uh, problems, you know. And uh, at the night, maybe the, maybe some people come kill you uh, while you are sleeping. Has that happened before? Yes, okay. it happened. You know, many people kill and uh, hit it while they are sleeping. Food line. And are there fights? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh my Every god. Day. Every day. Look, look, look. Every day is situation. We spoke to a senior doctor working with patients in the camp to understand its problems. Um, 
I've been here in, in Mitalini for four months. Uh, I'm mainly based at the clinic here, but I have been doing in, uh, some sessions, you know, going over to Moria um, uh, and, and working in the camp there a little bit. Uh, you know, Moria camp has 9,000, more than 9,000 now. We're having a hundred people arrive each day. There was, um, on the 16th of September, there were 324 arrivals to the island. Um, so there are small movements off the island, but actually that's only, you know, uh, it's not decongesting. There are so many people in a camp that was originally designed for 3,100. Um, so we need to get people, people who already, you know, have been identified as being vulnerable, um, they need to be moved off the island to, to the mainland and, and so they can be looked after, you know, there. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. It's a crazy situation. Yeah. It's tough. We, we spoke to a few, a few people. Oh, I wish I could go home now. I, I, I regret coming. It's difficult um, to say. I mean, at the clinic here, we see largely single men. Uh, I mean, a lot of the people that we've spoken to are trying to establish stuff like that. And yeah, it's yeah. just. Yeah, yeah. I think you put 8,000 people into a place and, yeah, and, and, and then, the, uh, uh, you know, you are putting some ethnic groups together, but it's just the context. You put 8,000 people together and they don't know how long they're going to be there. They don't have any hope. They, you know, they, you know you're going to get violence. Of course you're going to yeah. get violence. It's, I guess 8,000 people it's, kind of at the end of yeah, the... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but well. it's, it's just a recipe for disaster. While Doctors Without Borders were working to help many of the migrants suffering in the camp, Several residents made some alarming allegations about Greek government doctors working inside Moria. And how do they get you to Athens with the bribe? How does it work? There is someone, a guide. You talk to him, and uh, he told us, if you want to take our advice, I can't take you to the place. Okay. He guided him to the doctor and make a paper for them and wait in uh, two weeks, one month to get these papers of passing. So the, after that, he can pass. So the doctors make the Yeah, yeah, yeah. he take a bribery. Also. After the session, there is many people uh, told us to come to the doctor. You can sell this advice, you can sorry, buy advice, or you can, we can take you to the doctor he can do something good for you to take official paper to go, uh, to go pass it from you. So is the official paper like a medical form? Yeah, a medical form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'll say you have a you have, uh, you have probably you have cancer, you have something bad, you have a, a danger, dangerous illness, like a cancer, like something else. We have a problem in kidney, you have a problem in heart, like that. And then you have to move to Athens. Yeah. We must be moved to Athens. As troubling as a potential bribes for passage scandal is, what we heard next was deeply concerning. When he got a fight, he got five, stabbed in five his back. Time, what killed you? Can you show I, I, Camera problem. We must put a camera. Wait, if you need, if you want to protect people, put a camera at least. big problem here. No give me medicine. To distinguish the criminal. I want to speak just to you. Distinguish the criminal. How do you know it's ISIS? You can come to me and my team. How, how, how do you know is ISIS? Maybe 1,000, 2,000. Well, we, we will come to your tent <laughs> and you can tell us. You said you know ISIS is operating in this camp. If you look at the people here, ISIS. asking for refugee. Why? Why? Yeah, because they are defeated in, in their countries. So they are looking for yeah, yeah, yeah. refugees. They are looking for a safe place. They are here. They, are, they can raid, they can kill, they can steal. And they have, uh, they have a monster face. They have knives. And they are causing violence they have in the camp. Uh, something bad. It's a weapon. 
not a lack of knife, something like a razors. كل مشكلة إنه نحاول نبلغ البوليس أنا We... قبل فترة ضربوني سكينة براسي ناس سكين فيه. Before a child he got. البوليس بلغتهم يقول لي قوم. He got hit in his head. إيه. يقول لي قوم اللاك. البوليس. He said police tell him go malak. Go go bitch. They do not care about our life. Okay. And they don't care that there are radicals in this camp. Radicals yeah. We told them to put a camera. We told them many times to put a camera at least to protect ourselves. Okay we we are. We thank them, okay, but we need a protection, a protection at least, protection. We appreciate the, what they do, what they do, food, okay, they are providing food, but we need a the very important thing is the protection, protection, and drugs everywhere, the drugs everywhere, this is dangerous, this is virus, must be defeated. There are, you say, something like 11,000 people here. How many would you say are ISIS or criminals? A good look, many of them. His life is not safe here. أنا هسه ما أريد من الحكومة اليونانية ولو أدري الحكومة اليونانية هي تساعد على الإرهاب وهي تمول الإرهاب داخل المواطن. How do you stay safe? Huh? We are got to protect us. You just hope you would cross your fingers. Yeah, got to protect us. We do not, we do not scare from anyone. If if they. If the government, if the government put a camera everywhere, they will discover everything. They will find out everything. Just a camera. معنيين يعني يقدرون يساعدونا. إحنا مو كل ما يجي صحافة نحكي نحكي والفيديو ما يطلع. Many 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 of you came here didn't send the message completely. حياتي معرضة للخطر. من دخلت من شهر الواحد باليوم إنه أنا حياتي ما في اليوم إنه نمت نومه مرتاح. He is atheist. He doesn't believe in any religion. Religion. His life under danger. Because you're atheist. Yeah, yeah, you're atheist. Is as he says. Is majority of the camp religious? Yeah, majority is the Islamic. But he is he's scared from the ISIS. He's scared from the fanatic people. ISIS. ISIS. قلا أخذ شوف الخيمة تفتر عليها من الداخل من الخارج كلها مشكلة يعني من كثر ما دخله وأنا أنا وشاني وارو شاني 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 One thing I think that is really important to understand is exactly how these asylum applications work. So in Greece, for example, they have the UNHCR EASO, or European Asylum Support Office, and they are there in the camps doing interviews with these migrants, asking them questions to determine who they are. Are they economic migrants? Are they potential criminals? Or are they actual refugees fleeing war and persecution? Now, one thing we know is that from 2015 to 2016, 80% of all Syrian nationals' asylum applications into Europe were accepted, with 40% of all other countries being accepted into Europe. Only about 3% were rejected during this time frame, with the rest being delayed until next year. We know that in 2017, Germany accepted the most out of any other country in Europe that being 261,000 asylum applications, not including those who illegally entered. Now, many of these people came through Lesbos. So we wanna know just how many of these people are still coming in, who are they? And in 2018, is this process still working the way it was initially supposed to? Ariel Ricker welcomes an asylum seeker to a legal consultation. The Hawaiian-born lawyer abandoned her practice a year ago to set up Advocates Abroad, a group that offers legal aid to those seeking international protection. Rika herself took on Lesbos, ground zero in this great experiment, out of concern for American human rights standards. America is a land of migrants, and there is an anger, I think, about 
how, how this election turned out. We sent a producer to meet Ariel in Scala, a tiny fishing village in the north of the island that was home to several NGOs and hundreds of aid workers and volunteers. In the Goji Cafe, a hub for volunteers, he recorded this meeting. I tell them that this is um, acting. All of this is acting. All oh, acting is this is theater. So for them to get through, they must act their part in the theater. And that is the refugee and trauma because these Yazo officers are so fucking stupid that all they know is what is written on the paper. Yazo says this is refugee and trauma. They have these characteristics. So we coach people how to have these characteristics. So like the first role playing activity we do is like us and um, and they're the officer. And then we cook around after they've had some practice to see how should I walk into the office, how should I introduce myself, how should I give them a folder, and then how do I sit down, and then when do I stand up, when do I show them how to pray. Why would you need to show them how to pray? Because, well, because it's, it's a good way to show um, honesty. It's done in other places too, like um, not good places, to see if you're truly what you say you are. You can't show how you pray. Oh, you're actually Christian. Oh, so if you're saying you're like fleeing persecution, but... Like, you know, this is, they also ask like, what's your favorite holiday? So like, some people just say like Christmas, um, but like, we explain you can't just say this because it's not sufficient answer. You have to say, um, and you have to say it in a certain way, just like, December 25th, which is Christmas, which is the first day of our Lord and Savior. There is a formula we came up with, which is ironic, because I suck at formula. But it's like significant events, date, and location. So the way you answer all those questions is the same way. December 2017 in Izmir, Turkey, I was threatened for being a Christian because my boss and his friends dropped me when I was leaving my church. This is the Bible they tried to tear up. This is the crucifix I was wearing that they tried to tear. And it made me feel unsafe as a Christian in Turkey. But boom, because you have, you have all the elements in there. Like our narrative timeline format like has uh, like a fill in the blank section at this point. Now, a video has been released allegedly showing the executive director of a major NGO which provides help to migrants discussing how she teaches refugees to lie to border guards. Well, this video that's been doing the rounds online um, is part of a larger investigation project. The clip allegedly shows Ariel Ricker, who's the executive director of the legal aid NGO Advocates Abroad. In this video clip, she seems to be uh, telling the undercover crew who were filming her against her knowledge that she coaches uh, refugees and migrants on how they should uh, how they should speak to border police. They've also since deleted their online social media presence, their Twitter account is gone, and their Facebook account has gone as well. These recordings highlight the worrying attitudes of NGOs towards the very idea of borders. In the car on the way to another part of the island, Ariel confirmed not just the existence of smugglers inside Europe, but revealed the level of support for their actions among volunteers and aid workers. Smugglers, actually, there's various classes of smugglers in my mind. Um, there's angels, they're very rare, but they're two hero angels that I love. <laughs> they're the jet ski heroes. <laughs> and like, this is, I don't know what they're actually called. I don't know their real names, who they are. But they both have been arrested, uh, like on and off. Like the jet ski hero of Izmir was just arrested actually here in Lesbos the other day. So his deal is basically he doesn't charge except for what the petrol costs to get from Turkey to here with um, on a jet ski. Wow. And he takes them on his own jet ski personally and he drives them from Izmir to here and drops them off. And then he skirts off into the night with a little jet ski. Oh, I love them so much. <laughs> and he's done it like thousands of times. So he's taken thousands and thousands of people. Interesting rumor. Uh, apparently, there's going to be a passenger ship docking in Lesbos this morning with the leader of ERCI on it, this uh, Panos Moraitis guy. Isn't, yeah, he's the one that's in uh, hiding from police for the last little bit. Apparently, he's going to be on this boat. Um, so I think if we if we can find a way on the boat, we can get an interview with him. He's been in the news because of these allegations of people trafficking. And, you know, from what I'm hearing, he's been making a fuck ton of money 
when his organization is supposed to be rescuing refugees in the sea around Latvos. Yeah, if, if I, I'd be shocked, you know, this, we know there's a big business going on on the other side now, but if it extends all the way to Europe, that's is exactly, exactly what we've been talking about, these European NGOs making big bucks on this crisis, so yeah. let's do it. Quite uh, grave, actually. Uh, espionage, uh, getting access to state secrets, facilitating uh, smuggling and human trafficking, money laundering, forgery, and breach of the telecommunications uh, code. And, and how many, how many people have you helped in the, in the first place? At sea, more than 55,000 people. So, a lot of media saying you are a human trafficker. I just wanted a very direct response to We have never facilitated human trafficking. We have never assisted any smuggler. We're quite against it. We're here to save lives and nothing more. They said that uh, we were actually money, money laundering. Unknown sums of money. And the press in Greece said like 500 million. And in reality it was uh, 500,000 euro, which if you engage with things you know it's a small uh, amount of money actually, for three years. Wow. But we were, we were laundering it. So I've just gone back to watch some of the footage, the interview we did with Panos, the head of ERCI, and I'm listening to the undercover recording we have now. Panos denied all of these allegations to the police and publicly. He said they were partaking in no money laundering at all. And I'm pretty sure I just heard his lawyers say to us on tape they laundered half a million dollars. I'm, I'm just also really alarmed here that his lawyer is telling us that laundering half a million dollars is nothing compared to what other NGOs do. I, I don't even, I don't even believe what I'm listening to right now. Um, I, I don't know. Is this, is this a one-off thing? We, we have a lot more investigating to do on this island. That's for sure. Given the huge numbers of people entering Europe and the authorities' apparent inability to handle the scope of this crisis, it is no wonder that we are seeing an increase in migration-related crime. With a wave of major terror attacks across Europe following the influx of millions of newcomers in 2015 and 2016 to an increase in rape, knife crime, and murder, trust in the European Union's ability to handle this crisis is at an all-time low. At the European Parliament in Brussels, a small but growing number of MEPs are working to highlight not just the cultural cost, but also the economic cost of the crisis at Europe's borders. So what is migration costing Europe right now? Our research is going to show it's somewhere in the region to 150 billion euros to 200 billion euros a year for all the 27 European countries and the European Union funding together. This is not sustainable. Merkel let in two million people. That has had a profound effect on the societies and especially uh, particularly the Nordic regions as well in Denmark, Sweden, uh, Norway that's not actually in the EU but is part of the Schengen area as well. They've had a profound, that's had a profound effect. 
poursuivre dans ce modèle de l'immigration euh, que nous subissons, une immigration qui, qui vient principalement euh, euh, du Maghreb, d'Afrique subsaharienne, et évidemment cette immigration elle a des conséquences dramatiques, des conséquences économiques et sociales très lourdes. La France elle compte 6 millions de, de chômeurs, de personnes qui cherchent un emploi, euh, plus de 9 millions de personnes qui vivent en dessous du seuil de pauvreté. Donc évidemment ce sont euh, l'une des, des conséquences de l'immigration. The uh, Migration Advisory Committee said that large-scale migration hasn't brought the huge economic benefits that, that uh, the left have argued. Actually, in some cases, and particularly now is provable, if you're poor across Europe, you've actually suffered. Your wages have declined. You've become more cramped, more dense in the housing. It's been more difficult to try and get into social services. Those have been accepted facts now. And then there's billions spent on communications, um, a migrant compact, Um, it's just billions and billions and billions wasted um, where actually we could just be centering on the answers, which is our answers, which that the voters want, is that we stop the migration coming and the fast tracking of the migrants that are already here and then to stop more coming. And it is by bilateral negotiation and not by... The EU, the EU doesn't have the, the solution, they are the problem. Of course the NGOs are aiding and abetting because the NGOs are ideologically opposed to us as well. And ideologically, they are wedded to the fact that there should be a borderless Europe and there should be a borderless world. And so therefore, they are aiding them. You're seeing segregation in Swedish cities. You're already beginning to see segregation in German cities. It's well recognized that if you have large-scale migration rather than drip-feed migration that fits into the economic needs that we have, you'll get segregation, separation, and also people starting to look at each other in a very negative way. This is not the future for a, a countries in Europe. In some of Europe's often overlooked outlying countries, militia groups have taken it upon themselves to bolster Europe's professional border security, often patrolling the deep forests at the continent's far-flung borders. Сержант, чуваш ли ме? Ту няма сликва с тях си. Турки! Обратно! These militias are well-organized and intimidating. 
with mixed support from local and national authorities. Many of the men carry only airsoft weapons. But to migrants detained in foreign territory, the effect is just as powerful. The height of this movement of people was back in 2015 and 2016. So Europe has had over two years to watch the dust begin to settle. Where are these people now? What are they doing? Did they get the lives that they dreamed of, that they were promised? Are they just glad to be safe? What about those who came for work? Did they ever find what they were looking for? I want to know whether all of this chaos and confusion was ever worth it. So we're just here in Paris where tens of thousands of people are arriving from across the Mediterranean. Many people think they are coming to a paradise when they arrive in a big European city like Paris. But in the other camps we found across Europe, a common sentiment is that it was not the paradise they were expecting. And in many cases, their life was better back home. And we want to interview and talk to some of these migrants and see how they feel living here in Paris now, especially where they're staying underneath bridges, where they're sleeping in tents on the streets, where they don't have a job, they aren't really integrating into society. We want to try to understand what life is like for a migrant here in Paris in 2018. Là, il y a fait, ça fait six mois comme ça que je suis arrivé à l'Italie. Je suis en France ici. Je n'ai pas de travail, je n'ai rien. Et voilà. Malgré on parle de français, mais on est arrivé à la France, on n'a pas. Jusqu'à présent, on n'a pas trouvé refusé, on n'a pas trouvé autre. Au Mali, tu vois, non, le Mali me manque. Surtout, surtout euh, le parcours que j'ai fait. Je viens sur la mer, tu vois, non. Donc je sais que c'est. Je, je prends ma vie à risque de venir à la mer, tu vois. Non. Et à ce temps que j'étais au Mali, je n'ai jamais pensé Europe comme ça. Surtout la France, oui, hein, tu vois, non. Donc j'ai pensé que c'est un grado, qu'on vient, on va trouver des maisons, on va trouver des boulots pour travailler, pour envoyer quelque chose à, à la famille qui n'ont pas, qui n'ont rien, qui ne mangent pas à l'air faim. Je pensais que c'était dur, mais je ne pensais pas que c'était plus dur que ça. C'est un erreur, c'est un erreur. C'est un grand erreur, c'est un grand erreur. Tous les Africains qui viennent, tous les Africains qui viennent, surtout avec la mer là comme ça, tu prends tes vies à risque, tu vois ce que dit la dernière, d'aider encore et voilà. Tu, tu viens en Europe aussi, tu peux faire 7 ans, tu n'as tu pas le boulot, tu n'as pas le travail, tu n'as pas le papier, tu vois. Et voilà quoi, c'est un, un grand erreur. Unable to claim asylum, unable to go home, Migrants and refugees alike have found themselves stuck 
between a rock and a hard place. The truth is nobody wins in this situation. But what about other countries? What happens when a refugee is granted asylum or a migrant is accepted by the state? Direct provision began in 2000 as a means of providing basic accommodation to asylum seekers while their applications were being processed. Uh, it's, I suppose, in the news a lot more because there is a huge increase in the amount of asylum seekers that are coming to Ireland. As well as that one centre, 500 asylum seekers are also living in hotels and B&Bs around the country and many and thousands more are living in other integration centres around the country. And this is the Grand Hotel in Wicklow. And what do people in some of the towns involved really think? I think it's a disgrace. You know, I really do like, I mean, you know, no hotel in the town. They need a home too, but we have to look after our own first. I'm afraid. I am, like, I'm afraid. Like, I'm on my own with two kids down here and then having people that I don't know. Adrian Shanaher is the hotel owner and made the decision to close the hotel and reopen it as a direct provision centre. Quite simply, it was a decision taken for commercial reasons uh, where we took a view that we could stop those losses or indeed um, try and turn a profit. In Ireland, small towns have found themselves at the centre of a heated debate about migration and what European nations owe to those seeking a better life. We're kind of a forgotten town at the minute. For a county town, it's probably other than a bit of crack and a few points, there's not much in the place. It was misrepresented to, to the people of the town um, and that a lot of the migrants who are living in it are not, econ they're economic migrants rather than genuine uh, people who are oppressed or something of that nature. I don't know whether that's really true or not, but that is a common, commonly held um, belief. It wasn't a great, a great thing to happen to the town, purely because we have no hotel, but it's not the right place for these people. They should be in uh, lovely housing, uh, apartments where they can do their own cooking, cater for themselves, and, and, and just mind themselves. That's all they want to do. Well, I suppose it's just, it's your hometown. You don't really want to, you just want to see people having fun, having crack and a, a bit of laugh, but like, we don't have choice and this is up to the councillors and all that they're, they're our voice but uh, it just seemed to go unnoticed and like for a hotel to go into town I just I don't understand it. Initially I mean everybody got a fright. There's no doubt about it. We got a fright. There was absolutely no notice and all of a sudden the hotel's gone and we have a hundred single men moving in. No doubt about it that there's a generally held belief in the town that we're not being looked after properly. We weren't told, and, and it was, it was absolutely disgraceful, but the county council here don't start me on it. They are, they're, they're a law unto themselves, and I have to be very careful what I say because they could sue me. It just seems to go, it goes from bad to worse. The amount of people that are becoming homeless at the moment is unbelievable. It's heartbreaking to see people coming to you who, have been, who are lovely people and have nowhere to live and they don't know what to do and, you're, and you've, you can't say, listen, I can get you a house. The rental market has gone sky high. The, the rents are sky high around Wicklow. So it's, it's not reachable for people. I think there's 4,000 people on the housing list in Wicklow. Well, this is the provision sentence in Wicklow. And a few of the people that we've spoken to have kind of expressed concerns over funding. No, not answering that. No, no, I'm not answering that. Not answering that. Okay, is that no. just because... No, I'm not answering that. Uh, really uh, no, I'm not answering it. Uh, uh, can we just stop that for a minute? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm an investigative journalist based in Dublin, and most of my work has been um, around investigating corruption within the institutions of the state in Ireland. In the past, I would have written quite a lot on the fate of refugees, and I'm talking about genuine refugees, um, and to the point that I actually won a national campaigning award for my work on the rights of asylum seekers. So I have been very much, um, 
I suppose, um, on side with, with the plight, of course, who, what journalists wouldn't be, of real refugees leaving war zones. Because we now have a serious housing crisis in Ireland and we've had it effectively since the crash in 2008. Um, we never had homelessness per se, at least as far as I can remember. I grew up in the 70s and 80s when we had a brutal recession. Um, but I never remember people sleeping on our streets. And in the last few years, we've got this now in Ireland and it's shocking and devastating to see people in a first world, very wealthy country um, being reduced to living in tents, etc. So then when you start to study the statistics, um, you see that one in three social housing units is going to a non-national. And then you start to look more closely and you see that uh, a lot of our resources in terms of healthcare and education are also um, being used by people who are coming here at a time when we are not able to look after our own people properly. And to me, when I looked at the figures, I have a background in, I studied economics in, in, in university. And when I looked at the figures, I said, hang on a minute, what are we doing inviting the world and its mother into Ireland when we cannot look after our own people? My name is Mankaza Nachuma. I came from Zimbabwe to Ireland to seek asylum. I left uh, Zimbabwe because of the political uh, situation and uh, because uh, my life was in danger with the police, so I had to leave the country. We were protesting with the other members uh, against uh, our former president, uh, Gabriel Mugabe, and uh, they thought it was uh, unlawful that we do that. My life was in danger as well as my son's life was in danger and um, it got to an extent whereby uh, my son even got um, sexually abused when he was two and a half years old. So that's when I decided I had to do something. Uh, at first I didn't know where I was going. I just, uh, what I knew was that I had to leave the country and uh, I paid a Nigerian guy. I can't remember the exact figure, but it was a lot of money um, I had to pay him to do my passport, which was a fake one, though it's not mine. Uh, and uh, he bought my ticket as well. And he gave me the ticket and gave me instructions uh, as to what to do exactly. I went to um, South Africa. And when I got to South Africa, I got an agent. Um, that uh, agent helped me to come here and he only said I was going to, we were going to uh, Europe, but he didn't say where in Europe. He also gave me instructions that I must uh, tear the documents because they're not my documents originally. And uh, he also told me that if I arrived here with those documents, I could be arrested because it's against the law. So I tore the documents and uh, I flushed them in the toilet. Why, why was your life in danger? Because I had a friend um, that was a lesbian and she was my best friend. And um, we had um, like some pictures together as a friend, though she was known that uh, she was a lesbian. So they assumed I was the partner and um, so there were people that were looking for her and um, that's why they came to me asking about her and I told them I wasn't her partner so that's where the whole thing started. And on the sexual abuse, they said um, they were, it was their way of correcting me um, doing what they did to my son. Most of the people have been, wel have been welcoming here in Wicklow, but uh, there is some people that are still not uh, yet opening their arms for us. But uh, we hope at the end things will be better 
that they would understand us. I'm grateful because my son got all the help that he needed. He got um, to see uh, doctors, psychologists, and all. Um, if you could give a message to the people of Wicklow, what would you what would you say? Well, I would say um, they have really nothing to worry about when it comes to us because we are harmless and we hope that um, maybe with time they'll get to accept us. I feel very nervous, yes, because the owners of the land, they're also they're struggling with, uh, with housing and uh, what more of a person like me, a foreigner, that's coming into their place, you know, and uh, when I look at it sometimes, I feel like it's not fair that I've got accommodation and some of them, they're living in the streets. You know. you know, not having like more foreigners in your country or Islam seekers like ours, I think, and them will be thinking maybe we'll be getting their jobs in the future or with the housing uh, thing uh, going on now, the crisis, so it's going to be kind of uh, difficult for them to accept uh, foreigners coming over to, to their place. There are some difficulties, there are some welcoming hands as well, so because I don't blame them. It's, that's exactly we can, whatever we can do, even me and my country, if I see someone who is a foreign, it's not going to be easy for me to accept them. So I don't, I, I don't really blame people who don't accept us, but I, 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 respect their, I respect them for that. You can't have open borders when you can't look after your own people. I've spent a lot of time travelling around Ireland in the last few months talking to communities that have rural, very rural communities um, that feel very threatened. And of course it's rural Ireland, Our, rural Ireland is the heart of Ireland because our cities have become so multicultural that they don't even feel Irish anymore. You go into a shop or a hotel and the chances are you will not be served by an Irish person. Um, so rural Ireland is where you get the real Ireland still. So people are very frightened. If you speak out in any way, shape or form against migration in this country, you are immediately called a racist, um, a fascist, a neo-Nazi. It's disgusting. Um, and, but this is all being done because there's big money behind mass immigration into Ireland, as there is across Europe. This is all about money because these people don't care about the migrants who come here and end up homeless. So um, it's terrifying for rural Ireland, terrifying. And they see their towns and villages changing utterly. They see mosques going up. Um, they see, you know, things to the, that to them are just completely alien and they feel they feel under attack and they have every reason to. We have one tiny little island, okay, to call home. That's all we have. We never went and colonized anywhere. We just have that. We have 60 million in, Amer in America who claim Irish heritage. And even though many of them or their parents or grandparents were forced to leave because we have always had a history of emigration, they would someday like to come back here and their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and they have a right to come back and claim their Irish heritage. We have many millions more living in the UK, Australia and New Zealand and across the world and they too have a right to call this island home. So um, I'm sorry, no disrespect, but Ireland primarily should be for the Irish people due to the nature of our very unique culture and the fact that we were colonised for nearly a millennium by the British. We fought hard for our independence. Now we have it, a hundred years, and what are we doing it? Giving it away again. Makes no sense.
Do you regret leaving Afghanistan? Uh, yeah. We weren't told. It was, it was absolutely disgraceful. One day you can have 500 person. It's the best country. Best country of my life. I want to go. What? Then we cross, they never come back. I just, I don't understand it. It's a business. I think it's a business. It's heartbreaking. Send me there, send me there. Send Granny there. Going into this, I thought I had some understanding of the migration crisis. Coming from a political background, from a journalism background, having read the material, looked at the studies, spent a lot of time talking about it, I really thought I had a better understanding of this issue than most people. And I think there is a cultural pressure for people in general to pretend they understand these giant crises we're dealing with and to offer solutions to them even when we don't have them. And I can tell you right now, being on the ground for four months, meeting these people, being in the middle of these shipments, these NGO operations, the camps, all I have discovered is this is all so much more gray than I ever could have imagined. Are these people invaders? Are they intent on destroying the Western world? No. A lot of them are like you and me, just born in very unfortunate countries with unfortunate situations that they have hopes and dreams of leaving. Are they refugees? I can't sit here and lie to you and pretend that they were. A lot of the people I met, I think the majority from countries that weren't in war, people that had enough money to be able to buy a ticket to get on these boats, who had sold houses that they owned in their home country, who had businesses in their home country. But they certainly weren't coming for the sole purpose of just invading the West, pillaging its resources, or because they wanted to escape some sort of terror. And this is the these are the narratives that are sold to us by the media, that they're either escaping terror or coming to pillage Europe. The truth is, they have been sold a lie. Human traffickers, the media, how they portray Europe to these people, is it is a paradise. These migrants truly believe they are coming to paradise. You know, you have all these people who are constantly chanting open borders, who want to help, who genuinely in their hearts believe they are doing good and they show up at train stations holding signs that say refugees welcome, they knit them blankets, they bring them baskets of food and they just think that bringing these people in is the most humanitarian and beautiful thing that you can do for both Europe and these migrants. But where are they when the cold French winter sets in? Where are they when these people are sleeping under bridges and living on the streets? And eventually, when we figure it all out, you're going to have a very broken and poor Europe and a lot of hungry, homeless, lost and displaced people who were sold a lie. And a lot of very wealthy, evil men. And this this is the story that I didn't expect to find going on the ground, but it's what we got. The story of a borderless Europe is one where nobody wins. <laughs>